I am grateful to have this uh, panel uh, put together here this evening but, and call them friends. Uh, we are all on the Cold Case Foundation. And as you can see, uh, some are wearing their swag and, and Anne's in her, uh, her Christmas sweater, which I know she's going to win uh, whatever uh, prizes are coming her way. But uh, let me tell you a little bit about this panel uh, that's been assembled here this evening, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome Dr. Ann Burgess uh, in the middle there. We're honored to have Ann with us again. Uh, the highly acclaimed Netflix series Mindhunter was based on the fictional character of Dr. Wendy Carr directly off the very real Ann Burgess. Um, and Anne is currently a Boston College professor. She's a pioneer in assessing and treating trauma victims. She uh, and FBI agent John Douglas developed a new type of criminal profiling of notorious serial killers when the Behavior, unit, Behavior Science Unit first originated. She and John collaborated for over a decade. John Douglas wrote about their work in his renowned book, Mindhunter, inside the FBI's elite serial crime unit. His book was the basis of the fictionalized Netflix series, Mindhunter. John was one of the one of those writers, as well as Anne participated in assisting in that series. The TV series ran from 2017 to 2019, and it got amazing rave reviews internationally. We're thrilled again this evening, and I'm thrilled that she's here and to call her a friend uh, to have one of the original mine hunters this evening, Dr. Ann Burgess. Welcome, Ann. Thank you. Too. Well, when we look at this case, what do we know? What do we hear? And again, we're only going on information that has been released uh, very little. But this is a case where, and from the victim standpoint, it's a blitz style. A blitz style means that there is no prior interaction before. In other words, victim and offender don't talk, don't do anything. And it's in the middle of the night. It's in a room that we presume is dark. We've had no information that lights were on or anything like that. So we want to ask, well, what type of personality would do this that would uh, take a very vulnerable victim, two victims actually, and kill them as they did in a matter of hours? So it's not someone that's going to be very extrovert, in my opinion, because it's not like a Ted Bundy kind of thing. And I have to go on the data that I have, which was with serial killers uh, and the ones that we looked at. And that, that tells me that it's not going to be someone that's really good inter that interacts that well with, with people. So I suspect and would say that he's isolated. I think it's a he, I do not think it's a she um, and has to have complete control over a victim that's sleeping and is in the most vulnerable position, is in bed, sleeping, so to speak. So from a personality standpoint, um, I would say that's where I would start. Uh, there certainly could be, anything's possible, but it really looks, in my opinion, like it's one person. To have two people or more than, unless it was like a gang. I mean, sometimes you hear these horrendous things on gangs, but it doesn't in any way seem to have that that uh, part to it. So I would say it's one person who has had the house under surveillance or had the, um, the victims under surveillance and, and knows to some degree what, what their routine is, so to speak, uh, that he has planned it. I absolutely agree with what, what Greg has said, has planned it. Um, and, and the dark is very important. I think Gary really emphasized that, that he commits this in the dark uh, has a certain uh, importance to it that he can't see, doesn't want to see, uh, or I don't know, turns the lights on. We don't even know that if the lights get turned on at any point in this. Uh, it seems hard unless there was the moon out. I, I don't know whether they have um, checked on how, how bright was it outside. I'd like to know that. So sometimes you can get a very full moon and, and get some light coming in. But he had to have known enough about these, uh, plate, the uh, location of the rooms 
to get where he, he got to and um, at least get to two floors. Why didn't he just, that he let two of the victims go on the first floor? Why didn't he let one of the victims' rooms go? We, we don't know. But at any rate, um, I would say one, to answer your question, I think we're looking at one, but I wouldn't rule out two if, if you, it would be much harder, I think, to commit this with two. And I would have thought there'd be more evidence of like footsteps you know, leaving or footprints leaving the house. I, I always wondered why they didn't, because I think there was a light snow that night and that would have been important. Yeah, I was going to add uh, to what Gary said that he might even have a um, a whole host of knives. Uh, a, um, I remember one case that I did when we turned, they turned the mattress over, incredible number of knives were right under the mattress. It was his, uh, he was very proud of that, but yet he didn't show it. You know, he didn't like have it on the wall or like some people would have display there. things. so that might be something that uh, is, is looked for if they ever get a suspect of um, what type of, I, they keep saying it's a single blade, fixed blade. Uh, I don't know why they're saying that, but at any rate, that uh, that's the only information we have on the knife, but it's, and it's missing. And I think Gary's right. I think the, the it was taken, it was kept with him. I think he would find it on, it's not the type that would just throw it away. And, and, Talk about the the point that Dr. Bricado made about uh, potentially the token aspect. Do you believe there he could have not only taken his own knife, but other items from the potential crime scene? I would suspect he has, right. And it would be, again, uh, you, people would have to know what they had, but the most common thing is to take you know, like a, a license that has a picture on it. Um, it could be a, a school um, badge kind of thing. Mm -hmm. or or something that especially if it's targeted especially if it was one person which they seem to be talking about that there is one person mm -hmm. yeah dennis oh, rader oh, dennis yeah. didn't dennis rader do that btk he took uh, uh yeah. Fox, fox's driver's license if i remember right mm -hmm. a lot of them kept driver's license yeah interesting and, and then they would relive the crime they they go over and over so all four you'd have to look to see if there was mm -hmm. And he certainly has killed before, but I think he's killed animals um, and really practiced there. I, uh, make me curious about what kind of work he may have done or is doing that involves knives or, or that kind of um, activity. Whether he has actually killed humans is not clear, but I what I think is clear is he's going to do it again. Um, when the fantasy fades, when some of the talk of the case kind of fades, and he's not able to keep the, the um, fantasy alive, that would be a critical time. And I will say to, to back up what uh, Dean said, we do have information from you, Chris, if you will, on the area and how remote it was and how you took the video of that, because it's as important. If you want to catch a suspect, you got to find out where he is. So how does he get out of the house? Where does he go? Uh, you know, is he in the in the community or is he from another community or does he have a car, et cetera, et cetera. All of those could be looked at um, that are not part of the crime scene. So that I think that with all of the investigation you all have done, that that would be really, really important to, to look at. And nobody seems to be talking about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, the, the dynamic of that, was one way in one way out once you turn left on that street uh you know it's it's a pretty you know contained environment i'm just going to say that what we do know about many of the killers is they're very bright so that their iq uh, at least that's what we found in our the majority were i don't know whether gary can comment on his his sample but uh they're very bright and they're able to plan and carry it out and get away with it, which is what yeah. I wanted to uh, follow up on Dean's question on the incel. There is not a lot of research going on. It is something that we are looking at. I have found a, a study that looked at 250 incels, but it looks like there are many, many incels out there. They have their own groups and social media is evidently pretty, pretty uh, populated with it, but they, there are groups that, do not get into the violence. So I think that's 
the good news, if you will, but there certainly is a group that doesn't. We have 25 cases that we're going to look at in, in more depth to see where there has either been a murder um, that they have murdered and then they suicide absolutely follows what Gary's research has, has shown. And then there's some others that they were able to arrest for other crimes before they um, became violent. So it, it's a very interesting area that has not been well researched and really needs it. And I think that's where law enforcement needs would need to get up to speed a bit on that type of offender. I'm not sure whether it's a new typology or whether it's an expansion of what we have seen before. That, that's something that we really want to uh, look at. I have a, a contact, a journalist, uh, Greg Heropian, who is out on the West Coast. And he is in good contact, frequent contact with Ed Kemper. And we wanted to know if Ed, when he went to see him, whether Ed Kemper would be able to put, weigh in on it, uh, not knowing whether he you know, watches any of this or whatever. And so uh, Greg did talk with him, spent some time, took some crimes, uh, took some scenes off. The only thing I could take him, because uh, you could take it into the into the prison, were outside pictures, of course, pictures of the house, you know, and anything that was on the website. So uh, Greg had a series to take in. And so one of the comments that Ed Kemper said is he said, uh, and I'll just read from, from the notes, Greg said, I showed him photos of the of the victims, we sent pictures of the victims, and the house. And he said his first comment was the house was really weird looking. And in a way it is, it's a very unusual looking house. And so that's what caught his attention initially. And then he wanted to know whose cars were parked out there, which of course were the victims' cars as I understand it. And then he said the skin dog corpse found nearby might not have been because of the murder it could have been done by a wannabe. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I know what that was. And then he said, if law enforcement had tried to speak to Ed through the media, we wanted to know that question, he wouldn't have responded. He said, any evidence is evidence. And if you have no choice but to leave evidence during a crime and you don't want to add to it. Uh, and then uh, Greg talked to Ed about a time when he had left a himself in one of his crimes, a footprint that had been left in the mud with his size 15 boot and how he decided not to create more footprints by climbing back down the embankment to try to erase it. So he was very aware, Ed Kemper was very aware of evidence and leaving evidence and what he would or would not do. Now, Ed, of course, for those of you who maybe don't know, he would always kill in pairs, not always, but usually killed in pairs, killed his grandparents, killed co-eds in pairs, and killed his mother and her friend. So that there was this kind of thought of uh, multiple victims. And he, um, I think the other interesting thing about Ed is there is a, was a printout that he had decided that he would move from just what he said, just killing co-eds and then start mass killing. He had already thought of killing mass and that's when he turned himself in. So um, uh, the other thing that Ed Kemper did, of course, was to um, de decapitate the victims and cut their hands off. And that was because of, in those days, don't forget, it was just DNA or fingerprints that they would go after. And he thought he could... Uh, he was doing some way of, of so he was thinking ahead of the investigators. Yeah. During, during, oh, yes. Uh, post, oh, yeah. post crime, post uh, incident behavior. Right. And he would try to in, insert himself into the investigations. Don't forget. He would sit with the police. Yeah. And, and ask how things were going. He said he, he was a friendly nuisance. Mm -hmm. The police. So to answer your question, yes, people are talking about it. But evidently in the prisons, he only has access to local news. So he did not know anything about this. That's why we, uh, Greg had to take photos in. What's fascinating yeah. is these guys are weighing in. Yeah. Right? They're, when they're asked, they're weighing in, which, you know, that, this has been in your wheelhouse, uh, you know, for many, many years. Uh, they really are, uh, when you sit down with them, some of them are very likable, but they're so evil on the other side of that persona. Sorry, Ann. Yeah. Um, 
I think that the social media issue is huge. And I think that I hope that they have examined the uh, hard drives of, of the victims to see whether any messages came in or whatever. But that gets into the profiling. And uh, what do we think? You know, would he be uh, under an assumed name, et cetera? I think Gary also brought out uh, after a podcast like this that there can be a lot of very interesting um, call-ins.